Yeah, um, so this is the last session of the day, so thank you all for staying with us. Um, uh, those who were here last, last year will remember possibly my talk. I'm, I'm a member of the Patient Advisory Group for the CMRC. And it's great to be back this year, um, representing what is the patient voice to the CMRC. There's two of us here today, um, so it's great to be here again for the second year. And um, today, uh, David here has um, volunteered to come up for this panel Q&A session. Um, David, it's fair to say, has been, uh, I've been following his writing for a couple of years, and he's, I'd say it's fair to say he's been challenging the establishment view of the treatment and diagnosis of this illness in the UK for some time. And it's his first CMRC conference, so I'm delighted to say, David, tell us to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, so, hi. Uh, so, I'm very pleased and a little surprised to see myself here this year. Um, last year, it wasn't really possible for me to come because, as some of you know, I was engaged in conflict with the organization or with the former vice chair uh, of the organization. Um, so I'm very glad to be here this year. I feel like I've been welcomed very warmly and I appreciate that. And it's great to see all this um, medical, biomedical stuff going on and not a word about CBT. Well, some GET, but for other reasons, um, that that has been absent. Um, I just want to, I got into this not because I, I don't have a family member, it, it was more a friend of mine got sick, I started covering, um, uh, I have a doctorate in public health from Berkeley and I was a journalist for a long time before that. And so, uh, you know, this sort of fits in my area of interest, so I've sort of been pursuing this as a journalist but also with my public health background. And I didn't plan to be doing this for this long because I thought if you write a 15,000 word expose and point out that a major trial has people who have been recovered at baseline and that they didn't actually get informed consent for their protocol, that they changed all their outcome measures to make them weaker at the end, that that trial could not survive. I've been shocked that the PACE study is still standing. I've been shocked that it's been defended at all the highest levels of the UK medical establishment and academic establishment. I'm shocked that Fiona Watt just recently again repeated the meme that, pay, that researchers are getting harassed and so on by patients. I'm curious, does anybody here feel like they've been, who engaged in biomedical research, feel like you've been harassed by the patient community? If so, raise your hand. Okay, can we put that meme to rest finally? It's not true. Only certain researchers who violate basic scientific principles have been criticized by that way. And I will say that from having researched the patient's critiques, the patients are right. It is the PACE authors and their colleagues and the people who have been doing this research that are engaged in anti-scientific behavior. They're the climate change deniers, not the patient community. They're the ones who are committing violations of scientific principle. And I would put to you that PACE is a major case of scientific misconduct and really needs to be investigated at the highest levels of the MRC and the UK academic and medical establishment. It is impossible to have a study in which participants meet outcome thresholds at baseline. If 13% of your participants have met an outcome threshold at baseline and you do not reveal that in your study, that is research misconduct. It is very clear. It's not hard to figure out. Why in the UK this has not happened and why until last year in the US this has not happened is really beyond me. I would really like to get to the answer to that. And that question is what's driven me these three years to keep doing this. So I intend to keep doing it. And uh, you know, I'm not a scientist. I sort of seem to be in the business of debunking research rather than creating new research. But I'm trying to debunk bad research to make room for the good research that you're all talking about. So again, thank you for whatever, for your work, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, thank you David. Uh, can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah. Um, do we have any, any, any questions for David from, from the floor? It's supposed to be a panel Q&A, so if anybody wants to stick their hand up, please do. Uh, no? No, that was no. easy. <laughs> that was easy. All right, thanks. Um, if anybody else wants to come up and say any, anything now at the end of the day, um, from a research point of view, um, you can have five minutes, no problem at all. Uh, is anybody else interested in coming up and speaking? Yes, is that at the back? Um, I just wanted to know if he's heard about uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Mr. Vastag. Is that as a question to David, is it? Yes, has oh, he heard of Mr. Vastag and... What was the question? I'm a little hard of hearing. 
Have you heard of Mr. Bastag, who's won a case in the no. in a court in a court later recently? Yes. Brian Bastag. Brian Bastag. Oh, Brian. Yeah, Brian. What about him? I just I just wanted to know if you heard about him and um, do you know him personally or? I, I know him person. I've known him personally through email and you know uh, I haven't met him personally, but I I know we're in communication. I wrote a story recently about him uh, because he just won a big case uh, against his disability insurer. Um, he got a settlement, or he, he won the court case, and I guess they're now going to have a, some kind of settlement. So he had filed um, for disability and kept getting turned down, as we know happens all the time. And because he was well connected and because he had resources, uh, he was able to get all the testing and you know lawyers and stuff and fight it at great expense and won. So. On the one hand, that was a heartening win because the decision was very strong. On the other hand, most people do not have those resources and can't go to those lengths to you know, get the benefits that they deserve. But did you have a specific question about him? No, 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 nothing. Well, no. you're already answering. Yeah. So, answering he's been, he's, already. He's, so it's, it's, he's been Well, the other thing I wanted to know is, yeah. do you think that it will be easier, in America at least, to use his testing to prove his case for other people? Oh, to use his case as it for in, for other people, it doesn't have the uh, so that's that's complicated. It doesn't have there's no precedent value in the decision. However, it's a forcefully written decision, and judges do look at other decisions, so it can be cited in a, another court case. But it's certainly not dispos It's not precedent or anything. It doesn't control anything other than Brian's particular case. Um, but it can be cited and used. It just doesn't automatically mean any, any other judge will see it the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Does anybody else have any more questions for Mr. Tuller at this time? Um, if you're not aware of his work, he, he writes a blog regularly on the Virology blog, um, and I certainly get the updates by email, so I read them when they come out. It's always, yes, he, he writes he's straight to the point, his diet, our David. <laughs> so if there's no other, and nobody else, um, I, I guess I just hand back over to Stephen for a wrap up of the day. Is that okay, Stephen? Oh, well, of course it is, and I think, you know, summarising a day today, uh, Philip, is, is impossible because it's been such an amazing journey we've all been on. I think there are three things I would say. Um, I think we've stopped looking over our shoulders now. Um, I've been in this collaborative for five years, and each year I've been involved in it, there's always been looking over here. That's finished. Done. You know, we can stop that don't need to do that anymore. People need to sort out what needs to be sorted out, but we're looking forward. And that's the thing that's come through on the last two meetings I've been at, is that the whole spirit of endeavor of the United Kingdom community, whether they become, whether they're patients, clinicians, or researchers, is to try and do something about this on a national scale. And I think that now has to be our single-minded approach as we look towards the future. And certainly, as I sat down this morning, I wondered what the mood music would be like today. And that's the mood music I've got. I feel people are getting on the train and the train is leaving the station. And that's a fabulous feeling after five years of struggling to try and get the molecular and biomedical aspects of this complicated group of diseases taken seriously. So I think we're beyond the point of no return now. Not going to go back anymore. We're not going to look over shoulders anymore. That's done. We're going to go forward. And we've had some wonderful examples from Lewis and from others of what can happen if you do pull things together in the right way and how you can then develop the added energy of collaboration by bringing different types of researchers onto the stage. So that's the second thing, and I think that's a, an incredible success story, if you don't mind my saying, of the last five years' work, whatever, however long it took to get there. And that came through today. But the other thing that's come through today, to me, and I'm sure it will come through more tomorrow, is what a key role the patients and carers play in this agenda. Because us as clinicians really aren't there to just feed ourselves with knowledge and to understand disease. We're really there to help people. And of course, to do that, we need to have a proper relationship with the people we're trying to help. And so the third thing, as I said, that's really shown today 
is how the patient and carer population really want to work with researchers and clinical scientists to help move this agenda forward. And so I think together it will be successful. This will be successful. And if it's not successful, then I shall resign. And that's no joke. Because I've been in this five years now. And, you know, would another five years of this be worth it? You know, could I look back and say another five years of struggling to get people to realize this is a serious medical condition that needs proper scientific study? No. So I think we're getting to a point now where we're having those serious conversations. And you've all helped enormously today in putting the quality science, which is what we've been looking for all these years, in front of us and parading it and saying, look, if we do things properly, this is what we get. And so that, to me, is the most fantastic way of finishing the day. And I want to thank all of the speakers who, without question, gave us a fantastic portfolio of uh, information that's given us and lit up uh, our interest in such an amazing way. I want to thank them. I also want to thank all the people who are here. Some will have got lost in some of the technology, I know that. But nevertheless, as I looked around the room, people were engaged in the process. So this is a common journey for us all, and I'm just so delighted that the day's worked out so positively. So thank you all very much indeed. Uh, I'd like to uh, suggest to you, you have a nice relaxing evening now, because you've been here an awful long time, learning an awful lot of new stuff. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you.